sitting on my doorstep The people's passing by They're coming back from getting wrecked Everybody's high Saturday night, what a bitch Laying on the lawn The morning comes to bring the switch After the buzz is gone Hello and welcome to another episode of Addictions, the podcast about addictions. I'm your host, David Wagner. Today we have a very special guest on the show, Amy Dresner. Amy is a former stand-up comic who went through a lengthy battle with addiction and has recently written a memoir titled My Fair Junkie about her experiences with multiple addictions. And I've got to say, after reading Amy's book, I simply could not wait to get her on the show and do an interview. And I would highly recommend this book to anyone affected by addiction in any way. The book really cuts to the bone and really details the perils of drug addiction in stunning detail through stories of Amy's various experiences with drugs and her eventual success in winning her personal battle with addiction. Before we listen to that interview, I want to let you all know that as always you can listen to all of the episodes of the Addictions Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and anywhere else you'd find podcasts. You can also listen to the show on our website, which is www.addictionspodcast.wordpress.com. One final thing, if you really love the show and want to help support what I'm doing, check out www.patreon.com slash addictions to learn how you can donate and help me continue to improve the show. And as always, thank you so much for listening. Now let's bring on our guest and get this party started. Today on the show, our guest is Amy Dresner, comedian and now writer. Uh, She recently wrote a memoir, My Fair Junkie, a memoir of getting dirty and staying clean. And Amy, I've got to say, I read the book and I couldn't put it down. It was, there's just like so much stuff that I could relate to as a recovering addict myself, you know, and I can do nothing but commend you on your writing. It's, it's amazing. Oh, thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. So, I, I mean, first, my first question, I guess, would uh, would be what, you know, what, what was it that made you want to write the book? I've been wanting to write a book for like 20 years. And, um, you know, as a former addict, we're, you know, we're very good at the short term stuff. You know, we're the, we're the sprinters. We're not the marathoners. And a book is very much a marathon. Um, I've been writing for the addiction recovery magazine, the fix for since 2012, you know, and people were like, I love your articles. Like you got to write a book like more and more. And, but I had been sort of a chronic relapser, you know, over the past 20 years, I'll, I had five years uh, back in January. And so I didn't really ever feel like there was like a full arc that I had landed somewhere that I had a real story to tell, except for like, Hey, you know, I got sober for a couple of years, then I ate shit and I got sober again and I ate shit. You know what I mean? It was very much like that until sort of this last relapse, which really changed the game completely where I lost everything and got arrested and, um, ended up on the chain gang and, you know, in sober living for two and a half years and just got sort of the attitude adjustment that I needed. So then I had really felt like, you know, this was a different sobriety and I had a story to tell and there was a narrative arc, which is what all the editors want. And uh, so, yeah, yeah. So a friend of mine had gotten a book deal and she was sober, a comic. And uh, I said, hey, can you pass on some of my writing, your agent, see what he thinks? And he was like, oh, my God, I love your writing. And he was like, so we set up a phone call and I pitched him my idea for the book, which was sort of you know, using the chain gang as sort of the framing and then flashbacks to different parts. And he loved it. And so we got cracking. And that was it. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, with with my own addiction, you know, I mean, I 
I broke my leg and, you know, it all kind of went downhill from there, obviously. But, you know, really the pain for me from my injury wasn't really all that bad. I was using to escape my depression and everything, just like the majority of us, you know? Yeah. You know, but, you know, there's, there's, there's a variety of reasons that people get to that point, obviously. Right. But, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it it can be childhood trauma. It can be, you know, multiple things, you know, is now like in the book, you do talk a lot about your early childhood and how, how things were you kind of coddled, you know, and, and during my childhood, it, I look back and it's the same kind of thing. I was really kind of sheltered for a while. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then once I was able to go out on my own, I kind of just, you know, exploded on everything. Yeah. And I, I don't think that's really all that uncommon. Uh, it's, it's hard to like put a needle on it, you know, but, uh, you know, it's a lot of parents, you know, of course they care about their kids. You know, I, I myself have a daughter and, you know, it's, it's difficult to give them the freedom, you know, and, and it's, it's just not easy. I th- I think that's kind of a, a part of the problem, at least with, you know, experimenting with drugs, but whether or not it's going to lead to addiction is a whole nother yeah, story. Yeah, that's the whole thing. You not know? everyone who tries drugs becomes an addict. You know, you just don't, you, you just don't know. And it's like, I mean, I think that part of the reason that I was sort of afraid of drugs for so long was I think deep down I knew th- that it was going to be a problem, no, although it was not conscious. And um, for me, I felt um, a real biological click when that stuff when that stuff hit my system. I felt sort of this weird vortex opened up and it was like, oh, my God, it was just terrifying. I'd never felt anything like it. I mean, I'd had an eating disorder prior to uh, my drug addiction and then sort of like a sex addiction as we, you know, you write about in the, in the, in this, in the early part of this sobriety. And to me, they're either all connected. It's all ways to check out. It's how do I get out of my feelings? How do I get out of my body? How do I escape reality? You know, I don't want to feel my feelings. So it's, to me, it's, it's, it's all, it's all connected. You know, I make this horrible, I think I say it in the book, you know, I realized, you know, I could, you know, I put something in my body and I changed my feelings. It didn't matter if it was a, you know, a Xanax or a donut or a cock. It was like, bam, you know what I mean? And so, um, but yeah, I mean, I, and, and I guess there was some stuff with my, you know, I was coddled and that created a sense of not being able to navigate in the world. Cause I was sort of crippled by having everything handed to me and by my overprotective parents who didn't believe I could co- sort of take care of myself. And then there was sort of an anxious attachment with my mom who was, you know, recovering alcoholic and had had a schizophrenic mother and then sort of this enmeshment with my dad. The whole thing was really confusing, but I also suffer from depression and I had been on psych meds since I was, I don't know, 20 and, uh, was always looking to medicate my depression. So when I found crystal meth, it was like, Oh, this is like what Prozac should feel like. Wait a second. Yeah. You know, it felt yeah. like I felt normal for the first time. And who doesn't want to feel normal? You know, it was like exactly. I felt balanced. I didn't feel, you know, super, super high. I felt like, oh, this is must this must be the baseline for other people. Just like being okay in your skin and not loathing yourself and sort of, you know, not being terrified of social situations and you know, all of that. Yeah, yeah. I, I yeah, and I, I for me, you know, it was like Eventually, it got to the point with my opioid abuse that, you know, I wasn't taking it to get high anymore. I was right. taking it to to okay. function, to, not to get to, sick, to be normal. Of yeah, course. yeah. Okay. And and the withdrawal was what scared me the most about getting clean and wanting to get clean. You know, because I mean, I, I broke my femur in a car accident, Oof. and I, I explain it to people. I say, you know, physical, full blown physical withdrawal from opioids. I'd rather break my femur again, two times over, oh, God. Than, <laughs> than go through that shit again. You know, I mean, it's it's crazy. Uh, and there's a really, especially in my area, I live in a very rural area, you know. So there's one doctor in our entire county who can prescribe Suboxone. Um, wow. You know, and, and so I tried to get into that program for seven or eight months. And finally, I bit the bullet and said, fuck this. I started buying Suboxone on the street from, you know, heroin addicts. 
and I I huh. took the you know I did I did everything right. I took the clinical opioid withdrawal scale test thing and all that shit. Made sure that I was in withdrawal when I started, and I I found my my dose that would work. Stuck with that for a while, and I tapered myself down. And you know, be- before long, uh, here I am a year later, and I'm I'm sober. You know, wow, incredible. Yeah, it, it, but that that is a huge problem, especially here in Michigan. And the crazy shit about it is that, you know, five or six years ago, there was to find heroin here in Michigan. It was like a needle in a haystack. Right. But now, but now it's it's everywhere. Wow. I mean, it's it's crazy how quick it has just exploded. Yeah, it's frightening. The whole thing is frightening. I mean. You know, there's there's heroin everywhere. There's opioids everywhere. There's meth everywhere. It's just, it's really, it's it's terrifying. Yeah, and one of the reason I, reasons I started the Addictions podcast was to kind of, you know, quell some of the misinformation about addiction and about drug addicts. You mm-hmm. know, because uh, I see so many people that are just saying things like, uh, "Don't give the junkie Narcan. Just let him die." You oh know, my it's god! Natural so selection. horrible. It's so horrible. It's fucking crazy. It, it just blows my oh, mind. Oh, it's so horrible. Wow. Wow. You know, and it's that it's, have some compassion. Yeah, man. I mean, I've heard that. I heard that because overdoses have gone up so much that the price of Narcan has that far, big pharma has like doubled the price of Narcan, which is just so gross. It's like, oh yeah, let's make oh, yeah. off people's death. That's awesome. Yeah, and and you know, it kind of related to that is a lot of these sober living homes, and you mention it in your book. They're more into just you know making money off the backs of these drug addicts. Yeah, I mean, I've written a lot. Or halfway of houses and yeah, stuff. Yeah, I've written a lot of articles for the fix about you know those where it's like you know bunk beds. You know, there's you know six dudes to a room. You know what I mean? And they're totally breaking housing code, and they're just you know. I mean, I was really lucky. The sober living I was in, it was her home. She lived there. She had a baby there. So it was nice. And she let only, she only let, she was very selective about who she let in. You had to be very serious about your sobriety. And there was only maybe five of us. So um, that was, a, you know, it was a completely different experience than some of the other sober livings I'd been in or the one that I talk about in Tarzana where I was sort of like with all those dudes. You know, yeah, um, yeah, but um, yeah. I mean, I think the whole treatment industry is is, you know, it, it's now with insurance and that kind of stuff. It's like whether the people who started them started off actually giving a shit about addicts and wanting to help addicts. Now it's become extraordinarily corrupt, and it's become like one of the biggest. It's like a thirty-five billion dollar business, and it's like, you know, I mean, you hear about all these horrible things where they sort of they they ship people out, you know, put people on planes from other states and get them insurance here in California. And, uh, and as soon as their insurance runs out, they just kick them out of the treatment center. And so then there's like all these kids from Kentucky or wherever that are just like homeless. They don't even give them a flight back. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, don't get me wrong. There are good sober living homes out there. There are good halfway houses out there. And they're great. And there are good treatment centers. And it's like, you know, it's, it's not the whole, you know, it's, but we need more, uh, more oversight, yeah, on that more kind legalization, of stuff, you know? more rules. It's still very much the wild west. Yeah, still yeah. a lot of fraud and that kind of stuff. You know, you know, and even with the the prescribing of opiates, I mean, that has kind of tapered off to a degree. But you know, I remember when I first was prescribed the opioids, uh, I, I started out on like Norco seven point fives. You know, and my my doctor upped my quantity. Uh, and her reasoning for this was, you know, this way you don't have to come see me so often. Interesting. Yeah, and 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 then another just thing that just blows my fucking mind is that my doctor told me that, you know, I I about two years into my use, I I talked to her about physical dependence, and yeah. I that I was kind of kind of worried about it, you know. And she said, "Well, don't don't worry, we can treat that. We can treat that when that happens." Uh, and f- four years later, after I had been calling in my prescriptions two or three weeks early for Ugh. three or four mon- months in a row, Ugh. I get a letter in the mail saying that I'm no longer a patient, you know. Wow. Nice. Yeah. Right. So yeah. she basically yeah. hooked you and then just like mm-hmm. 
fucking cut you exactly loose. I shit you not. I shit you not. So That's exactly how it happened. Disgusting. I mean, I there um, has to be free rehab, first of all. Like, the fact that there yeah. isn't free rehab and that there's a waiting list, that there are people that are trying to get into treatment and can't get into treatment is just unacceptable. Yeah, so, with no insurance. You yeah. Know, I, I was... Yeah, that's not okay. You know, people are I, dying. And it's like, for me, you know, I was mostly a coke and meth addict. Um, yeah. Because that was... Because I'm depressive. So that was more balancing to me it was the it, it was what appealed to me I mean, i did get hooked on oxy when they gave it to me for a shoulder injury yeah um but i wasn't on it for very long and that stuff made me extremely aggressive and agitated. oh yeah yeah really agitated it's weird it was like um my mom just broke her hip and uh, i flew to santa fe and uh, they put her on oxy and it was really triggering to be around. I'm not gonna lie. It was really that, you know, New Mexico is the highest addiction and overdose state in the, in the whole United States. And wow. I used to, you know, I mean, my parents shipped me to New Mexico. My mom lives in Santa Fe years ago to get clean when I was shooting cocaine. And I, I mean, I found a drug dealer within, you know, three days landing there knowing not one single person there yeah that's, that's you know what i mean like crazy. hit the radar and just like you yep. know fa- like i don't even remember i saw some guy and i just i don't even know you just we just know it's like how we know yep. how people are sober now we know when people are like holding and using and they sold syringes over the counter and i was away that was it forget it shooting coke in a pueblo i was like okay my parents were like oh shit that didn't work <laughs> you know what i mean like they thought yeah they pull a geographic and it's just like no. Yeah. I just, I don't know. The whole, the whole situation is just, I, I mean, I wrote the book, I, I wrote the book to help people. I wrote the book to help addicts feel less alone. I wrote the most embarrassing, honest memoir I could. I mean, everything that I was like, God, I don't want to write about that. I was like, that's exactly yeah, what you need to put on. Those are the ones. Yeah. And I also wrote it for non-addicts to maybe get in the heads of addicts and understand us better what it's exactly. like to be in our head in our you know and um exactly the messages i'm getting that's what people they're like wow thank you like i understand my brother's drug use better or it was like having a you know i come from a family of addicts i'm not an addict but i this i was feeling it was it felt like having a conversation with them that i could never have and i just understand it so much better and you know and a lot of people were like thank you for making me not feel like a bad person Thank yeah, you. I thought it was. I thought it was stunning. No, it was amazing. thank you for making me feel less, uh, like less ashamed and less alone. And I was just like, oh, phew, you know. And I mean, yeah, it's embarrassing stuff, but it's like, you know. And and I thought I really, you know, I really wanted to get to that. It's the substance is part of it, but underneath it is really about the feelings, and those are universal. Everyone can identify with those feelings of self loathing or loneliness or whatever, you know. Because I think behind behind the using. Aside from the biolo- biological thing, but that 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 is a big part, at least of my addiction, um, is is feelings, the feelings, and that's still what you have to manage yeah. in sobriety, yeah. which is still I still hate feelings. You know what I mean? I never thought I could get through a feeling. You know, the feeling would hit me either to use or whatever, feeling uncomfortable, and I was like, ah, I got it. You know, rat in a cage. I got to get out of here. You know, it's like heating up. But how do I get out? And um, you know, it's now I realize, oh, I can feel my feelings and they're not going to kill me. I don't have to escape them and they will pass eventually. I don't have to do anything. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And for me, you know, I was pushing back all of all of those feelings, you know, that I was running away from. Oh, yeah. And the one the one big thing that I noticed was once I finally stopped, you know, it came back, but it was like a tidal wave. You know, it was it was overwhelming. But yeah. my the strength of all of all of those feelings you've been holding back for so long, it just, you know, and that can be overwhelming. It it, it can. Uh, oh yeah, early you know, sobriety it's, sucks. It's the, oh yeah, it's difficult. I mean, that first year is just brutal. It's so brutal. And people are like, oh, I had a pink cloud. I'm like, lucky for you, I didn't have a pink anything. I, you know, I was extremely, yeah, very yeah. uncomfortable. I cried a lot, and you know. And I said, and I, as I talked about in that, in, you know, in the book, you know, I looked for every other way to escape my feelings. I was like, okay, I have to stay clean. How else can I get out? How else can I check out? And I used every other way to check out possible. And I'm okay with that. I mean, eventually I put those things down, you know? 
So, yeah, yeah. but I mean, you know, it's like, it's a pro it's, it's a process. It's like, you know, trying to quit everything at once. I was like, mm, you know, I found honestly, the sex addiction part was much more uh, degrading than my drug use. There's something, yeah. you know, there's, you know, there, because of rock and roll and all that stuff, there's something cool about, at least I thought I was like, I'm cool. Look at my track marks. I'm a drug addict. Like, bleh. you know, I thought it was a badass, especially coming from, you know, rebelling against my background, but there is nothing cool about being a female sex addict. It's like really, and being treated like a piece of meat by strangers and thrown away. Yeah, it was exactly would drive home crying and just like curl up in the shower and go, I never want to do that again. And just like drug addiction, I would, I would do it again. And I was just like, wow, this is really frightening. Yeah. Yeah. I can totally relate. I mean, not, not so much with the sex addiction, but the thing is, you know, I, I play music in a, a couple of different bands, you know, nothing, nothing major, but, um, you know, for a long time, I would have to be high, you know, while I'm playing music, right. uh, because it just felt like, you know, it, it made me feel like I was playing better and things, you know, oh, this is fucking awesome, you know, right, right. But w- once I got clean, you know, and, and started jamming again, it's like, oh, wow, wow. Now this, this is good. Yeah. Yeah, I've written a lot of pieces about that, too, where it's sort of like, you know, we have this as as creative people, we have this sort of weird idea that, you know, we're more creative or, you know, when we're loaded. But it's like if I go back and read some of the stuff I wrote when I was really high, it's like, "Mm," you know, I mean, the thing the key is to turn off the editor. That's what the drugs and alcohol do is they turn off that editing in your head so you can just kind of let it flow and without judgment. Yeah. And you can get into that space without drugs and alcohol also, you know. Yeah, yeah. And also, you know, so many of the people that we, you know, look up to were, you know, that were the sort of artistic geniuses were sort of drug addicts and alcoholics. And we think that they're, you know, that their method, that we confuse their method with their sort of madness, you know. Of course, yeah. We recently did a seminar, actually, where we where we we kind of talked about meditation, uh, you know, and, and a lot of people actually engage in basic meditation without even realizing it, you know. Uh-huh. F- for example, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, in the morning I I give myself you know, fifteen twenty minutes just to sit there and let let my mind get going, you know, and it's. It, in effect, it's almost a, a form of basic meditation, you know. Right. And I, I really, I totally stand by that as a, uh, a resource or a tool to aid in, you know, that first year after, you know, that first year of sobriety. Uh, because it can just be, it, it can be hell. It really can. Oh, yeah. But, you know, to give yourself some time to just just let things drift through you can, can really help. I, yeah. I truly believe that. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, again, it was like, I had to studied, uh, like, uh, transcendental meditation and then it, you know, it made me feel so good. I stopped, which is such an alcoholic thing to do. It's like, Oh, this is really working. <laughs> well, I'm going to stop doing it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And there was still that part of me was like, well, if I'm really happy, like, what am I going to write about? You know, it's like, um, and then I got into a place of being too uncomfortable again in sobriety and too, you know, too much. I got my heart broken, you know, life, you know, was in session, stress, money, you know, my, you know, parents' health, all that kind of stuff. And um, I started to get really thrown around by my emotions. And um, I'm a very emotional person by nature, very, very sensitive and so a friend of mine in the program was like, you really need to start meditating again. And, um, you know, what it's given me is a, is a space where I'm not my thoughts and my feelings because we can really get carried away and think that we, our thoughts and our feelings are true and we are our thoughts and our feelings. And so when you meditate, you can kind of sort of see your thoughts and feelings and go, oh, that's interesting, you know. Oh, okay, do I want to get on that ride? I'm not sure. Oh, here comes another thought. You know, you have 40,000 a day. You don't get to choose which ones to pay attention to exactly you no know? exactly. but i was getting pulled around you know like on a leash by my feelings and it still happens and sometimes i'll just take a nap i'll just go oh i can't you know i'm i'm feeling totally fucking crazy and so i'm gonna just unplug and take a nap yeah i i truly think that people have a uh underrated sense of uh 
the worth of a good nap. Oh, totally, uh, right? A bath and It's an amazing thing. Or like a cheap massage. Are you kidding me? It's like a reset button. You're like, oh, okay. No. For sure. Yeah. um, One other thing that I wanted to kind of talk to you about was, you know, in my situation, I wasn't really able to get into a... uh, a program like uh, NA or AA. I mean, I really wasn't interested in that. Mm-hmm. I, I'm mm-hmm. I'm not really a religious person. Oh, and, I'm not either. That you know, f- really creeps me out. Really, it's me. it's it's just difficult for me to you know it. And I don't agree with a lot of the uh, the credo of NA or AA. I mean, if if that helps people, you know, so be it. That's great. But it's it's just not for me. Mm-hmm. But the big thing that I've noticed is that since I've I've started this podcast talking to people about it and explaining things and you know just just creating this community it's almost therapeutic for me in a way that's great you know and i i wanted to know if you know by writing this book was that somewhat therapeutic for you well not writing it writing it was really painful because i had yeah. to put myself yeah. back into sort of that headspace of active addiction because i was taking mm-hmm. you on sort of a shotgun ride with me you know, it's all oh, present sure. tense, you know what I mean? So put myself back into some of those situations and that headspace was really, really uncomfortable and painful. And I got, you know, depending on what section I was writing, I could be elated or depressed or, you know, whatever. But, um, you know, I, people are like, oh, you bash AA. And it's like, I don't, I don't think I bash AA and I, and I do go to meetings and I do have a sponsor and I do have sponsees and I find the tools, the tools are really from psychology and different religions. They're not unique. It's really sort of, if you boil it down, it's cognitive behavioral therapy. It's sort of acting yourself into right thinking and changing, you know, your thought patterns yeah. through action. So yeah, I would, I would say confidence definitely plays a very large role large role in that you know? yeah and it's just like i mean i and of course not feeling alone and having a com- immunity a community of people that think um you know as as that are as crazy as you you know and get your thinking and think you're you know also get how funny the darkness is and all that kind of stuff has been terrific but i don't you know i refuse to say a lot of the prayers and i just kind of block out the you know the religious you know, wordage, the verbiage that it really creeps me out. So it's like, and there, so I just, you know, I, I take what works for me and I throw away the rest. But what I have found, I mean, what the book gave me was, I, I, first of all, I was shocked by the response. You know, I had no idea how, you know, also it was like, okay, great. There's now I'm naked in front of the world, like completely. So There was like that fear right before it was published. It's like, oh my God, what are, you know, and I'm sure people have judged me. I don't read reviews. I don't do that because it's like, and it makes you afraid to write your truth. So, I mean, everyone has an opinion. Um, The people that reach out to me are the people that like the book, you know, um, and feel connected to it and, and thank me for my honesty. You know, uh, I think if you're trying to look good in a, in an addiction memoir, you're not being honest enough. (laughs) No, no, (laughs) of course not, man. No, so no. it's like, yeah, I was an asshole. Yeah. You know, I was really ill on drugs. Like if I wasn't an asshole, why would I have ever gotten sober? If I was a delightful human being in coke in my neck, you know what I mean? Like why would I, I would never have gotten sober if it was working for me. Um, yeah. Yeah. What it has given me is it made me feel like it was all worth it. Like 20 years of pain and I turned it into something that was useful to other people. And it doesn't feel like all that time was wasted. You know, it's so easy to go, God, I spent 20 years, you know, self-destructing and hating myself and trying to kill myself and being depressed and da da da. And then when you make it into something that helps people, you know, go, oh my God, like you made me recommit to, you know, getting sober or you made me feel less of a whatever. Like I feel like I turned shit into gold. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's that like, feeling of turning nothing into something. Yeah. And that feels awesome. To, yes, it does. To have been someone who was such a taker their whole life and so destructive to be to have created something that's helping people and that it came out of all that pain it makes me feel like a fucking magician, man. I'm like, woo yeah. you know, I was like, wow. And also, I, oh, feel, yeah. I feel bulletproof. Like, everyone knows everything. It's like, I mean, are people like, oh, my God, I want to date you? Like, I can't wait to date a 
you know, person who was arrested for domestic violence and was a sex addict and has epilepsy and whatever and been inside. Hey, you never, you never know. <laughs> I mean, um, I feel weirdly free of any shame because it's all out there. What's anyone going to say? Yeah. Oh, I heard you blah, blah, blah. It's like, I wrote about that, you know? Okay. And there's freedom in owning it. There's freedom in owning it. The shame is dropped. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it gives other people the ability to drop their shame. And that's what I wanted to do. Like, fuck. Yeah. And I would say that you honestly, I mean, honestly, you, you definitely hit the, hit the target dead on. It's like, fuck shame. You did the best you could at the time with the tools you had moving on. You know, you can't change the past. You can create a different future. It's like, whatever. I mean, shame kept me relapsing. It kept me self-destructive. And it's like, it's just, it's just not a helpful emotion unless you use it to change who you are. But it's like, you know, you can do that with compassion too. go, Hey, I'd like to go towards this positive thing instead of moving award, moving away towards this negative thing, you know? Definitely. Definitely. Um, well, I want to remind all of our listeners, the name of the book is my fair junkie, a memoir of getting dirty and staying clean. And Amy, uh, where can, where can our listeners find your book? Um, it's on Amazon in all different countries and, um, it's at Barnes and Noble and, uh, Kobo and I think it's in tar on target online. Awesome. If, if you go to my website, amydresner.com, I have links to all the different places you can find it, but I think most people are buying it on, you know, Barnes and Noble or Amazon and it's in different, you know, it's at book soup in LA. It's, you know. But, um, yeah, people are really loving it and it's a real ride and it's funny too, because it's, yeah, it, it's great. Cause if you can't laugh at it, you can't, you know, how do you get through it? You've got to find the humor. That was the big thing that I realized. I was like, I got to find the humor in some of this shit or I'm not going to make it through. Now, are you, are you, are you still doing stand up comedy no, at all? I've well, done no. stand up for seven years. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. When I got uh, any thought? Yeah, when I got arrested and tried to kill myself and had a nervous breakdown and was going through a divorce and a criminal trial, stand up wasn't at the top of my list. I kind of put yeah. that to the side. And then I was in sober living, and there's a curfew, and so I just sort of focused on, you know, not going to jail and sort of putting my life back together and getting sober. And I haven't missed it, and uh, I enjoy writing more and. You, know, you don't have to leave your house. You don't have to be around, you know, drunk comics at twelve thirty waiting for your spot. It's just not my world anymore. You know. Exactly. Exactly. Oh. And that's a that's a big part of it, really. You know, you you really truly do have to change your environment to a degree. Uh, I, you know, for me, that's one of the big ones. It was one of the hardest things to do, actually. Uh, you have to change everything. Oh yeah, you have to change everything and cut all your friends and the whole deal. You know, I mean, it's like you talk about, I. I never had really, I mean, with Coke and meth, there's not a real physical addiction except that you're like, you, you sleep for days, you know what I mean? And then it's over. Yeah. But, yeah. um, but I was frightened about, I mean, I could barely function emotionally on drugs. And I was thinking uh, the tsunami of sadness that was going to engulf me when I got off of drugs, I thought would just, I wouldn't be able to handle it, you know? And, um, you know, that, that was sort of the detox that I didn't want to face for a long time. You know, I, I just wanted to be numb for my feelings. I wanted to turn the volume down and drugs did that for me for a really long time until they didn't. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Or and until the physical I, I mean, part became really, you know, I mean, I have epilepsy from crystal meth and like shooting Coke with epilepsy is like not the smartest thing you could do. No, no, no. <laughs> I had uh, I had childhood epilepsy. Oh, um, you did? But I I grew out of it. Oh, you're it's, so lucky. Uh, it was a oh. it was a genetic kind of thing. Oh, you're so lucky. Yeah, I. So I can I definitely know what seizures are, oh, are all about. They're fun? they're not they're fun. So much no. fun. Oh, they're a fucking nightmare. I've lost my license twice. I've broken teeth. I've cracked my head open, and I have no aura, so I don't feel them coming. I just face plant and start flopping around. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, whenever I would have a seizure, I could always tell. Oh, you God, know, I'm so lucky. Yeah. I mean, it's controlled now through medications, but, you know, they definitely make me tired. Oh, man. Some of those medications oh, brutal. turn you into a fucking zombie. zombie. Yeah, I know. It's... Some of them are like, they're like, you know, they're like, my hair fell out. You know, I gained 30 pounds. You know, I couldn't remember my name. But they're like, but have you had the seizure? I'm like, I wouldn't even know if I had. I wouldn't even know <laughs> yeah. what it was called. Like, 
Now, look, I'm bald and fat. Like, I'd rather wear a helmet. Like, this is a horrible life. But I, I exactly. have under control now, and um, I'm really happy about that. So I have an S. That's great. Here. That's great. Yeah. Uh, one thing, one last question that I wanted to throw at you, Amy. I kind of ask this to all my guests. Um, is there any advice that you could give, you know, anybody out there who's really just struggling with drug addiction or alcohol addiction or, you know, any, any, any sort of addiction. Uh, if there's anything you could say, uh, what would it be? There's hope. Don't give up. I mean, I relapsed for 20 years. You can get better. I don't care if you, you keep relapsing, you can get better. And there is a community of people that you can connect with that have been through it and will help you through it. You don't have to go through it alone. And I don't think that you can really do it by yourself. I think you need support, you know, and it's like, um, I think, I think sometimes programs are good. I needed to be locked up a lot of times, either in a psych ward or in a treatment center to just get clean. I couldn't stop on my own ever. I really couldn't. I mean, the fact that you could titrate down on your own, I could never do that kind of thing. Um, but I would just say, uh, yeah, I mean, if I can get sober, anybody can get sober. Truly. <laughs> I mean, yeah, with the, yeah. the book. I mean, that was like 20, that was six rehabs and 20 years of fucking drug abuse. And, um, and I have five years clean now and it's, it feels like a lifetime away. Yeah. It's uh, an amazing story, Amy. You no, know, it is. It's like, I guess, you know, for me, the things that I've learned is like, I mean, even, you know, I got my heart broken and even being around my mom with her health crisis it was like those two times were the first times in this, this sobriety that I really felt a little shaky where it came in my head where I was like, I want to, I want to check out. I want to, I don't want to feel what I'm feeling. And, um, uh, you know, your feelings will not kill you, but the result of acting on your feelings through addiction will, you know, and it's exactly. like, you know, yes. I, I, you can have an urge to use. And if you just buy yourself 20, 20 minutes, you know, the, the urge will pass whether you use it or not. But if you pick up, you don't ever have the experience of getting through the urge and not using you know, you can stay sober whether you want to stay sober or not. I have. I don't always want to be sober 100% of the time. You know what I mean? I'm not like, woohoo, this is awesome, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, but I stay, I do it, you know? And it's like, I I don't listen to my feelings. I don't listen to my head. You know, I, I'm i disciplined now, you know? And I do what I need to do. And, um, and I'm accountable. And I wasn't like that yeah. before. And, um... So I would just say, reach out, get help, don't give up, you know, find, you know, it's like my parents believed in me even when I'd stopped believing in myself. Yeah. Um, a support, I, I write you know, to anyone, I write back to anyone who writes to me, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Having a support group is one of the most important things. I think so. Far. I think so. They get it. And it's like, sometimes you just need someone to listen to you or someone to go, it's going to be okay. Or I got you, you know. Exactly. You know, I'm here exactly. for you. Call me anytime. And it's like, you know, because loneliness to me was the core of my addiction, big time. You know, feeling unique and, lo and, uh, and alone and not knowing how to navigate and the pain feeling like overwhelming and no one got it and I was different. And it's like there's a, there's a huge community of us who feel exactly the same way. We know the pain and we know the loneliness and we know the struggle. And it's so much easier to stay sober than it is to get sober which sucks. Yeah. Yeah. There's always that mountain to climb. Yeah. You know? That first year blows. Like I said, it's like, that's, that's why they give chips and all that shit because it's like, it's so fucking hard in the beginning, but you know, it becomes, you know, it's not a diet. It's a lifestyle. You just, you, you shift it. And then, you know, as human beings, we have a hedonic adaptation and we adapt to good things and bad things. And then sort of, you know, it's, it's hard because it's new. But eventually it's not new anymore and it becomes your base. It becomes your normal, your normal thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so now being clean is my normal. Yeah. One of the, one of the, it's kind of funny because, uh, you know, the first few days where I was really sober, sober, it was like, wow, it's like sober is the new high. Right. I know everything's like yeah. bright colors. You're like, whoa. Wow. Right? Yeah. And, you know, yeah. well, yeah, I mean, you get to feel everything, which is good and bad. You know, you can't, that's the problem. If you, if you turn the dial down on your feelings, you turn the dial down on the happy and the sad. You can't just turn the dial down on the sad. You mute everything. 
Yeah, you know, exactly. You know, exactly. You know. Well, Amy, I want to really thank you so much for coming on the Addictions podcast. Thank you for I mean, me. it means really, a lot yeah. to me. I uh, I hope I ha- I said something that was helpful. I hope maybe people pick up the book and it will help them. And you know. And and I know our listeners are gonna just really enjoy your book. And I urge you all to go out there and buy this book because it's it's fantastic. And there's the Audible too. If you want to hear my manly voice and my bad impressions, you know. <laughs> oh, cool! I'm I'm gonna have to check that out. Yeah, definitely. I narrated it. I got to narrate <laughs> it, so that was fun. And uh, yeah, being in a glass booth for five days by yourself, it was like a lethal injection box. I was like, ah, <laughs> you know. But um, yeah. Yeah. I think that uh, my book gives people hope and it's like, you know, I urge people to not take themselves too seriously. And it's like I, I really have accomplished things I never thought I could accomplish. And I'm someone that I actually respect and and like now. And I never, ever thought that was possible ever. Yeah, you're you're a strong person, Amy. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of Addictions, the podcast about addictions. Once again, I would like to thank our guest, Amy Dresdner, and I want to remind our listeners that you should definitely check this book out, My Fair Junkie, A Memoir of Getting Dirty and Staying Clean. It is published by Hatchet Books, I believe available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. So go out and look for that. Thoroughly enjoyable. Uh, I want to thank you all for listening once again, and uh, as always, never quit quitting. the buzz is gone